so for those who haven't heard yet, the Alex de Bringat saga is officially over in Ottawa. He was moved late last night to the Detroit Red Wings. Dominic Kubalik, defenseman Donovan Sobrango, 2024 conditional first and a 2024 fourth rounder coming back. When you saw it break, what was your initial reaction? Uh, conditional was generous. I would say very conditional first. There is about yeah. five different things attached to that. Um. But no, I. When initial reports were first coming out, it was more like, all right, it sounds like it's going to be two players and two picks. I was kind of thinking the way they worded, maybe we'll get two roster players out of it. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> we have one roster player, one defensive prospect who's up there more in age. And to be honest, I don't know enough about him to separate him from the rest of our defensive prospects. But the defensemen are kind of, for the first time in a while, kind of set. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, all right, so really we have a middle six guy, which we needed, but I was kind of hoping for a little bit more, maybe two middle six guys, or something that could yeah. help the team now. But really, we just have one piece to help the team now when you're going one in, one out. It's a big drop off from Dabrinka to Kubli. Yeah, well, that's just it, right? And, you know, I, I think we're kind of in a weird spot as Sens fans as well, too, in the sense that for the longest time, essentially since Carlson and company left town, the defense has been a sore spot (laughs) to say it generously on this team. Uh, And and for the first time in a long time, we really are set on that blue line. So I think that's probably why they felt comfortable enough, I guess, and taking a, a prospect who, you know, he split time between the AHL and ECHL last year. And, you know, he's not going to be someone who's going to step into their lineup and make an impact this year. He might not ever crack an NHL roster, but thing, right? you know, he, he's someone who they can <laughs> afford to kind of be patient with. I, I'm shocked just based on their track record that he was a left shot defenseman when they picked him up. But I mean, such as life. But he's from Ottawa. Th- but there he's it Ottawa. is. So there's the give and take, right? It's one one or the other exactly so (laughs) i was literally what i was gonna say right it's either right shot defenseman north dakota or where's the ottawa ties and he played for the ottawa junior senators in the cchl uh so local kid and i mean you know 2020 third round 63rd overall he's got a little bit of draft pedigree there but it's kind of bounced around you look at his stats i mean ahl 39 games four goals three assists ECHL 23 games, one goal, 11 assists. I, I, all the scouting reports on him, he's not going to be, you know, that puck moving power play quarterbacking defenseman. He just kind of is, you know, bottom pairing, someone who could log some minutes and does the stuff in his own end in a responsible way. And, you know, there, there's a path for him to one day carve out a role with this team, but it's not going to be anytime soon unless some pieces start getting moved out because they're finally set on the blue line for the first time in forever. Yeah, it would be it'd be injuries, right? Like, I mean, if last year's any indication, Ottawa gets hammered with injuries often, and at least you have someone there that you can call that has NHL experience, and it sounds like he just has a safe game, right? Yeah. So it's just, you can throw him out there. He's not going to win you a game, but hopefully he won't lose it, and you can get the other stars that you have still healthy in the lineup going. Um, but yeah. we'll see. Well, really, the main piece really is Kubelik. Well, that that's just it, right? Like, you know, Sobrango, if you kind of even look at some of the signings that they made during this offseason, a couple of their draft picks, like, the, I mean, when you're only picking in the fourth round and beyond there, uh, not like you're going to be adding some instant influx of talent, but by and large, you know, Belleville kind of got left out to dry last year and they were a bit of an afterthought. And especially with all of the coaching overhauls that have gone down there in recent years, it's it's been a bit of a whirlwind. So who knows? It might even just be a case of trying to strengthen that farm system a little bit and stabilize it a little bit back there. As I say, Kubelik's the only thing that's going to help in the immediate future. But I kind of wonder with with that 2024 conditional first. And like you said, there's about five conditions on it because, you know, it's going to be the lesser of, uh, you know, Detroit or Boston. But then if, you know, there, there's a caveat that that pick could still roll over to the next year. And so, yeah, it's a whole, you know, Magna Carta of conditions, but at the end of the day, it's a first round pick. I'm wondering if they're using that for, you know, this was the trade before the trade, right? Freed up a little bit of salary cap space, not huge, right? 6.4 goes out in Alex de Brincat, 2.5 comes in in Kubelik. You know, you got 5 million in cap space. Yes, you have to go out and sign Shane Pinto. But is this something where you're packaging something like, a, you know, that first 
Brandstrom, maybe try and get rid of Joseph's contract there and, and something else. And you are starting to target maybe like a Konechny or a Clayton Keller, or re- really trying to fortify the, the that middle six somehow via another trade. I don't know. I really don't. Cause the one name that really, I mean, you're mentioning the trade pieces, but we are, like I said, we're really tight against the cap and there is about 5 million in dead cap. that's hurting us too. So it's almost like if anything, we kind of go with it and just see, okay, next year when the cap goes up mm-hmm. and then we have more of that dead cap coming off, then we can go ahead and make a move. So maybe it's someone that's, I don't know. It's, it's tough to say what exactly Pierre's thinking at this point. Cause I, I mean, you can almost already make the point of this is when you were supposed to go for the guy that has coming into maybe an RFA status when the cap goes up that you can kind of trade and hopefully sign. But it's, I don't know. I have a hard time seeing them trading for another piece right now, just with the minimal cap space. Cause we still do need to sign Pinto. Yeah. And then you have to think about the year after you're going to need to sign Sanderson. Mm-hmm. So that cap space is going to disappear really quick. And at the same time, you kind of need to keep that cap space for injuries. Like it, unless they're putting players on IR day to day call ups, like guys need to rest. You need a little bit of wiggle room there, at least a million, I would think, to call up someone from the minor leagues. So the fact that we have just under five million still being Pinto signed, it just really doesn't leave a lot of room. And it's one of those things that I was kind of always questioning in the back of my mind. Even if we did have to bring it in for the one year arbitration, all of a sudden we're just strapped. That's it. There's no wiggle room unless you're going to trade someone. And then again, you're eating salary probably to try to get rid of a bad contract, like maybe a Joseph and you're back to square one in the next few years where here's more dead cap <laughs> when you're trying to improve your team. And it yeah. just seems like we're, we're, we're now paying for those trades that we made earlier on where we were a cap floor team. And I was like, Oh, that's fine. We'll take on the Zaitsev contract. We can pay Murray this extra amount of money because we have cap space and we can push that down the line. But all of a sudden we're there. Mm-hmm. We're there and it's still hurting us, that cap space now. So we don't really we don't really have the wiggle room in the future to do any more of those trades where we'll trade someone and we'll eat salary. Yeah. Well, this is the problem that Arizona never has to face because they're apparently just never going to be a contender. They've still got what, like Pavel Datsuk's contract mm-hmm. on the books. And like, I, I mean, this is where it, it uh, the reason I bring it up is because it just seemed like such a bit of a bizarre throw in in the sense that it it was so conditional and so many strings attached to it. And Ottawa, I mean, you look at the situation that Dorian is in, does he know that he's already like going to get canned and you know, whatever, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just take what I can get. This is sort of my last hurrah. Or is he still trying to really prove to and Lauer and company that he is the long-term fit here because really if he doesn't make the playoffs this year, the the decision's already made. You have to absolutely clear house. Yeah. Even if Ann Lauer comes in and he's like, you know what? Let's run it back. Let's take a look at DJ. Let's take a look at Pierre, see what they can do, you know, with the handcuffs, quote unquote, off here and let them actually, you know, operate this like a real hockey club and I, I won't interfere in it. Well, okay, that's all well and good. But, you know, how much purpose does that first rounder hold are they holding it to the trade deadline because if not like i would have loved for them to have tried to have worked in like a bergren or a marco casper in lieu of that first round pick right that's exactly it and that's i think that's why people are disappointed because we're looking at maybe bergen or if not Soderbloom, the six foot seven giant (laughs) centerman winger right where it's like one of those pieces but that's what happens i guess when you kind of work yourself into the corner. He had no leverage. 